This is the first in what may become a long line of videos entitled This Week in Adventist Stupidity. I had intended to do a video on another subject, but this one is just too juicy to pass up. The article in question comes from Advent Today and it's called To the Judgy Church Lady Who Told Me to Go Back to My Ex-Husband and my spies brought this one to my attention. I'm now going to play the letter that was written by the Lady of Concern to the author. Dearest Lindsay, it was a sad day when I heard you and ex-husband are getting a divorce. You are too young to be making such a decision without some objective counsel. Your parents will not be objective, I'm sorry. I'm guessing this because as a parent I don't think I could be objective. Maybe your parents are different. This is not to be a flowery letter, full of support and prayers. I am upset that you chose not to honour your marriage. You instead opted to be a child of children, move in with your parents so they could help you, deprive the children of the father, and think this is okay. This is not okay. I have seen many young couples do this and they have the reasons. I am a child of divorce. The grass is not greener on the other side with someone else. No one will love your children more than ex-husband. You will regret your immature decision not to stick it out, no matter what the circumstances. That was what you vowed to do. One day your parents will no longer be able to help you because they will grow old. Sad fact we are all heading there. It is possible your children will have step-parents and half-siblings. Gatherings of family will become complicated weddings, graduations. Face your marital issues with ex-husband. We all parent differently, young mothers like you don't make time for sex when a husband feels most connected to his wife. Where else will he go for this delightful interaction? Stop what you are doing. Put your family back together. Let your parents be on their own. Be pissed at me, I care. I have never written a more agonizing letter in my life. I wish you would listen to me. I love your family so much, but you are not seeing the long-term consequences of your current decision. Too long apart already. Well, you left. Go back, apologize and commit yourself as wife and mother of ex-husband's children. They have two parents. Call me, phone number here. I know you and your parents will be very upset that I have the nerve to write to you in this fashion, but no one will tell you the truth. You are making a big mistake and I care and am willing to risk your love and our relationship. Judgy Church Lady P.S. I have not spoken to ex-husband and know nothing of your circumstances. Go home to your husband. Dear Judgy Church Lady This is perhaps the most ungenerous letter I have ever received in my life. I was shocked to receive it from you, a person I have always admired. Fortunately for me, I am blessed with an ironclad conviction that my decision to leave my ex-husband is the best for me, for him, and for my children. Your words cannot break that conviction. I have total peace in my heart. Well, however wrong your judgy church lady might have been, she was right in what she said, and she was doing the right thing by expressing her concerns. You don't like her actions because she showed you for the evil, treasure-hunting, self-serving skank that you were, and you're mad. And essentially you're lining up to tell her, F you, in a nice way. But I know many women who, for many reasons, do not have that peace or that conviction that I have. Letters like yours are, unfortunately, not uncommon in churches. Women ashamed, guilted, and oppressed by words just like these every day within our church walls. There's a term that involves many ladies who are divorcing their husbands for no good reason these days. Frivorce. In other words, frivolous divorce. It has become so common that this expression is used regularly among certain groups in society.
since I am blessed to have this platform, and I do not succumb to this kind of toxic theology, I would like to use your letter as an illustration. This letter is to you, but it is also to all people in the church who think they should send a letter like this. Shaming women for making the most agonizing, terrifying, expensive, and embarrassing decision of the lives is, to use your words, not okay. Well, it isn't okay. Toxic theology, eh? In other words, theology you don't like the taste of. You know why women hate letters the likes of JCL? It's because at least one lady has broken from the sisterhood. Probably a lady is still married and decided to remain loyal to her husband. All you're doing with this letter is trying to shame and demonise poor JCL. Probably in an effort to stop like-minded ladies from thinking about writing letters of their own. In this letter you call me immature, young, a child. You are, you know. Dependent on my parents. If you're moving back to your parents' place, then you are. And blind to the consequences of my decisions. That is self-evident. You imply that I am a bad parent to my children. Yes, you are. Any parent who would choose to separate their children from their other biological parent is a bad parent. Especially given the fact that you have four boys that are going to be ripped from their father just when they need him the most. And then to see you put up an opinion on Facebook decrying the separation of children from their parents down at the border and not seeing that you're doing exactly that in your own life, what a hypocrite you are. And that my parents are fools for supporting me. They are. And if they haven't yet pointed out your hypocrisy at separating the children from their father, while you're decrying the separation of parents from children at the border, then they're fools as well, which is probably why they're willing to take you back home. At the same time, you freely admit that you have no knowledge of my situation, a fact that you prove by getting several major details about my life situation wrong. I am, for example, not living with my parents, taking my children from my ex-husband, or being supported by my parents. My point is not to defend myself, but to illustrate how crazy it is for you to make so many assumptions about me when you obviously know so very little about me and my life. Well, one thing is very obvious. Defending yourself is really untenable. Your children are going to be separated from at least one parent, which makes you a hypocrite. If I were a woman with less confidence in her decisions, your words might have made me feel shame instead of anger. What if my ex-husband beat me? What if he molested my children? What if he raped me? Ah, so you're one of those who believes you should be able to use sex as a weapon in marriage. The record, he didn't do those things. But the point is, you don't know. I personally know women who have been married to violently abusive men, men who manipulated, raped, and beat them, and who have been sent letters like yours. What right do you have, you who know nothing of me and my marriage, to give me any advice at all? It has been established over the years that children have the greatest safety from violence from their biological parents. Women have the greatest safety from violence within a heterosexual marriage. What you're doing is increasing the risk of violence to yourself and you're also increasing the risk of abuse to your children. But that's okay. You uh, have an ironclad conviction that you're doing the right thing. So you go ahead, uh, get your children abused. I am a child at 36 years of age, but I was old enough 12 years ago to get married, 10 years ago to have my first child, start a career and run a household. I was old enough at 23 to make a commitment to a life partner, but not old enough at 36 to realize that it is no longer working for my family. 
Interesting logic. Is there some kind of secret Christian breakdown of which major life choices I'm old enough to make and which I'm too young and immature for? Now guys, get a load of this. This horrible woman, Lindsay, gets married in California, waits 10 years, then divorced the man who gave her everything she wanted. What does the state of California give her? Alimony for life. Carcity. Child support. Young Adventist men, are you listening? Another reason to avoid 10-year marriages in California. Or even better, avoid marriages altogether. All this Californian chick is doing is proving she is no better than all the other skanks out there who are in it for the money they can dig out of the men. Gold digging whore you are, aren't you darling? Too bad Christian can't be trademarked, so it can't be protected from abuse by Sino whores. C-I-N-O, Christian in name only. Now, I'm an old Adventist codger who's seen plenty of Adventist men at all ages get raw dog by the system. If you're a young Adventist man heading for California, stay away from the chicks here and especially stay away from this cougar. They will make sure they get their 10 years with you and then they're good for lifetime alimony and all the other goodies that come with their frivolous. So this chick has waited 12 years so as it makes it look like she's not in it for the 10 years. But that's all she is. A gold digging whore. You imply that my choice was trivial. That I was a bored housewife, or simply didn't put the work into my marriage that I should have. You, of course, don't know about the thousands of dollars, and years of marital counselling, we went through. You don't know about the nights we stayed up talking and talking and talking trying to understand one another, trying to find a bridge to close the ever-widening gap between us. Your husband didn't talk to the right men. If he had of, you would be eating out of his hand. Your choice was not trivial. The reasons for your choice are trivial. You were unhappy and figured that you were safe to blow up the marriage and collect cash and prizes. It reminds me of a phrase that has been popping up in my life since I left my ex-husband, that I took the easy way out by getting a divorce. It always makes me laugh. Let me tell you about the easy way out. Giving up the dream of the life I always wanted, the one where I had the perfect nuclear family, the one where I grow old with my partner. But if that was so desirable, then you would have stayed. The fact that you move on and blew up the marriage means you did take the easy way out. I'll take your real life actions over the flapping of your gums or the pounding of the keyboard any day. Finding a way to support myself financially when I have depended on my husband's income for the last 10 years. Thousands of dollars and hours of time with lawyers, filling out paperwork. Oh yeah, got to maximise the take we can get out of the old fella now, haven't we? Explaining to my children that mommy and daddy aren't going to be married anymore. And loading upon them the burden of guilt that they may have been seen in some way responsible for the fact that you decided to pull the pin? Years of being a single mom stretching bleakly before me. Loneliness and fear. Risk of rejection by people who don't understand. And yet, this is prefer preferable to remaining married? Darling, you've taken the easy way out. And Adventist men... This is your reward for being so nice to your women. Is that really the easy way out? No. The easy way is to stay in a toxic marriage, one that is killing both partners and seeping negativity, anger, apathy, resentment onto the kids. You do know that studies have shown that kids do better in such a relationship than under divorce conditions? At least I know how to do that. This, going out on my own, not knowing what my future holds. This is the hard way. Bullshit! The very fact that you find this preferable to staying within the marriage tells anyone watching that this is the preferable or easy way.
letters like yours place blame on the woman for the decline of the marriage. In this day and age, where over two-thirds of marriages are blown up by women in divorce, this is exactly where the blame belongs. According to you, I should go home, apologize, and give my ex-husband more sex. No comment. Let's talk about that. You know nothing of the intimacy between me and my ex-husband. There's a reason you don't know. Because it's none of your business. This is my story. And I will share it with the people who have earned my trust. You are not one of those people. Can we please stop telling women that it is the responsibility to provide sex for the husbands? Well, if it's not a woman's responsibility to provide sex for their husbands, then why get married at all? The way this woman belabors this point would suggest that she's too frigid to know how to keep a man happy. If this is common thinking among Adventist women, then are you listening, Adventist brother? These bitches think they don't owe you sex once they get married to you. You need to know, Adventist brothers, that women might be the gatekeepers to sex, but you, Adventist brothers, are the gatekeepers to commitment. You'd better find out before you get married what your woman's attitude is towards sex. If she's not prepared to give it up at least three times a week, then you'd better keep looking for a girl that will. In other words, no sex, no commitment. That if a husband strays, it is the wife's fault for not satisfying his desires. Given your obvious attitude that rape is possible within marriage, I'd say if you ever got to the point of cheating, then yes, it would be your fault. I can only assume that's what you meant when you asked where else he would be getting that delightful interaction. I could write a whole article about the damaging message. Women of the world married a divorced hear me. It is your responsibility to have sex when you want to. The end. Husbands, it is your responsibility to remain faithful to your wife. It isn't on her when you make bad choices. If you want your husband to stay faithful, then you better uphold your end of the bargain. Man. I feel sorry for your husband. His balls must be as blue as the sky from the lack of sex you've given him. I personally knew one Adventist man who was a nice chap. He married the daughter of the head elder, stayed in the marriage for four years. Eventually he pulled the pin and bailed out of the church as well. I found out later that in spite of the fact that they were married on paper, that the marriage was never, ever consummated. I was drowning. He was drowning. Our kids. Yeah, from the lack of sex you gave him. Were drowning. I left and I can breathe for the first time. You mean you don't have to put out anymore? I wonder if you'll be the same with the next man, or will be he be a Chad Thundercock who'll simply make you wet by thinking about him? I will not apologise or be shamed for making the difficult but right choice. Translation? I was unhappy, and now I can make out that everyone else was just like me because I don't want to be held fully responsible for my unilateral choices. Your words betray you as a person who cares more about the institution of marriage than the people inside it. And that is the way it should be. We are supposed to be making our desires secondary to the needs and desires of children and partner. Lindsay. Well, I'm not done yet. I've got some questions for you, Lindsay. Now, what are your plans that you've pulled the pin? You're going to start communicating with those white knights and Captain Saverhose who are riding to your rescue? Strike up a relationship with Chad Thundercock or Harley McBadboy? Become a cougar to some guy freshly out of school? Now, I'm not done yet. It's time to give the Adventist community in general a serve. Just take a look at the commentary that arose as a consequence of this article. Okay, look at this. We've got the first comment, wonderfully written. So many important points here. People never know what happens between a couple and they shouldn't snap the rash judgment. 
Another one criticises JCL. Oh, my word, the authors projecting their own issues in a very unhealthy manner. And then we come down to this gentleman here, Irvin Taylor. Good old Captain Saverho. As an old white male carbon unit, I applaud this SAO spot on. Whoever is upset with the use of I in this essay, may I suggest that if you do not respect yourself for the honest opinions you hold, it is difficult, perhaps impossible, to effectively deal with real world issues. And now look at Captain Saverho demonise the husband. Divorce the bum. Yes, right on. Good on you, Captain Saverho. Um, Irvin, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, it's always a man's fault, isn't it, Mr. Captain Saverho? You sure you're not really angling for access to Lindsay Snatch? Now look at uh, Rick Cannon, just uh, down the road. And he proceeds to criticise this lady in the same way. <sighs> Mr White Knight. Da, 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 da. Oh, look. White Knight riding into the rescue on his trusty steed to rescue a damsel in distress. And then we have Deneen Acres. Well, let's take a look at Deneen Acres down here. Amazingly fierce, beautiful and true writing here. So, so, so many women, both in marriages, need to read your message here. And if the writer of that judgy letter does not read these comments, I hope she knows how deeply wrong and humble her shameful attempt was. It could be wrong if she did know anything from the inner circle of her life, which she clearly didn't when she wrote it, but it's stunningly wrong given the circumstances. Sending you so much love. In other words, this is just a variation of you go, girl. <clears throat> and then we look at all the other ladies who lined up saying that they've been encouraged to follow her lead. I hope you're happy, Lindsay, with what you've started. Renee Painter. Complains about being shamed into staying in a marriage 26 years too long. Well, one beneficial side effect of that shaming would have been the kids had a chance to grow up before you bailed with cash and prizes. Most of the some subsequent comments were some kind of variation of, You go, girl. Well, she's not the first. Won't be the last. A few years ago, a chick in a larger Christian community decided she was unhappy and decided to bail on her marriage. Jenny Erickson was her name. I've pulled some comments out of the resulting fracas as they're relevant here. While churches that are conservative on divorce and remarriage, the Adventist church is working hard to get out of that category, teach that an allowance for divorce for sexual immorality is bilateral. If you read what Jesus actually said, just as important as what he didn't say. He allowed a man who, as a last resort, divorced his wife for the cause of sexual immorality to marry another woman in her place. What pastors teach, with few exceptions, is that a woman can divorce a husband for his sexual immorality, can then marry another man in his place. This is not to be found anywhere in the Bible. But of course, if you don't claim to be a Christian, this is of no relevance to you. If you do claim to be a Christian of some description, get with the program. Stop church shopping and pastor shopping and look for one that, looking for one that teaches what you want to hear. You don't have to shop very much to hear the popular Erasmian teaching on marriage, divorce and remarriage, but finding a church that has pastors who teach what the Bible actually teaches may be rather tedious, even difficult. Unbelievers, even atheists, sometimes understand what the Bible teaches better than most Christians. For most are Sinos, or Christian in name only, who don't know what the Bible teaches and don't care, which is a form of agnosticism. I assure you'll win, because the divorce machine will annihilate your husband, your children, and make sure you receive monthly tribute unto the pain of prison. You'll get the house, the cars, the friends, 
and lots of churchianity backing you up, claiming you are in the right, you aren't. In time, the real repercussions will manifest. Your children will lose respect for you and you will directly contribute to the deterioration of their lives because you weren't happy. There is absolutely no biblical sanction for the divorce you've started. None. And that means to call this or label that as being of God is simply satanic. You're a monster. And although you won't be punished immediately, thanks to the US government for shielding stupid women from the consequences of their actions, time will see you in misery. Your pastor was right. The Bible is right. And your husband is right regardless what happened before. And you are a beast consumed by its own wants and desires and deserve a nice spot in hell. A lot of churches with no way, in no way respect the institution of marriage. That's a big part of what Dowrock rise about. Now I have a link to Dowrock's website in the low bar. So you can go in there and you can start reading. There he has a lot of information about the way women behave in Christian churches these days. They'll say divorce is wrong, but what if she's being abused? Of course, abuse includes anything that makes her less than delighted. So divorce is just as common in many churches, if not more so than general society. I go to church every week, but I hardly think that marrying a church girl would be a safe move in and of itself. It depends on which church you're currently attending and which churches you will attend in the future. Remember, obesity, childbirth and divorce are all socially contagious. If the other women at your church are being abused, then you can count on it that your wife has been too and she wouldn't want to be left out of the fun. Looking at the picture of the guy and the fact that he did the dishes, you absolutely know this guy was working hard to provide for her and her kids and treat her with the utmost respect. I mean, at the end of the day, take a look at this. Here's a picture of the happy couple. Just blow it up a bit so you can take a good look at it. He's a nice chap. I can see it in his face. And here she is, waiting 12 years to blow him up so he can be raw dogged by the court system. That's what I call raping you in the assets. Now, to his credit, he hasn't really done all that much, as I can see. And you can see she's sitting there making herself look so desirable, and here's her kids how happy they are I know it's four of them are boys one girl just think how messed up they are when they're going to uh, uh, grow up you know I think this uh, particular story deserves a return of King's Peace here's a man who did everything feminists say is supposed to do in a marriage respect your wife, split up the housework, work hard, and he gets absolutely raped by the family court system, and his ex shits on him, calling him dude, amongst other disrespectful things. The information for the article is all there in her own words. It might take wake a few guys up who are still plugged into the marrying these American girls as an actual option. Hmm. Now... Another point, if you're on a Christian dating site, never talk to girls. If you indicate that they disagree with the church teachings on either contraception, premarital sex, or abortion. Okay, Lindsay, you want to know what's in your future now? Let me read it out to you. Mr. Unavailable isn't a specific guy. She left her husband right after the 10-year mark where she gets alimony in her state. The divorce is not legally final yet and California only takes six months from filing. 
yet she's been busy dating other guys to the point she's already figured out the kind of guy she no longer wants. I say I want a nice guy, but instead I've been picking the challenging ones, the ones that don't love Jesus, or the ones that say they do but don't mean it. No self-respecting Christian man will date a woman who isn't legally divorced yet. There's the workaholics. In other words, guys who actually earn a living instead of spending all their free time with her. She's a professional blogger. The underachievers. Oops. Guys who do have free time but don't earn enough money to tingle her. The closeted gays. Yes. Closeted gays. She's around about 36. It looks at least 40. I guess she's stuck with guys who want a beard. The ones that aren't over their exes. That is, ones who have plated an ex-girlfriend and are looking for another plate. Or the ones that only text at midnight after a few drinks. Poor girl. Got pumped and dumped and now is experiencing the joys of being a last resort booty call. Ten years of marriage has not prepared her for what modern dating is like for a 30-year-old woman who looks 40 and isn't hot. She really thought it was going to be like Eat, Pray, Love. Okay, here's a question by a non-Christian about Christian men. You might want to consider the reputation that Christian men and women are giving to those outside the church who care enough to seek for the truth. Question. Why are her orbiter knights so stupid? I mean, not like in usual naive idealist way, but in a straight up low IQ way. Are faith based orbiters just dumber than neck bearded atheist counterparts? Answer. The white knighting runs strong with them. Despite the fact the Bible just explains over and over how women are generally troubled, your average church and goatee wearing bass player on the worship team thinks he just needs to be nicer and more adoring of how great women are. They're daughters of the king after all and Jesus' special princesses. And maybe one of them will consent to marry him. And then he'll get to have sex with lights off once a week. And this is your week in stupidity. Adventist stupidity. <laughs>